So, many in the church today have this idea that we can be united to other Christians because of the the blood of Jesus Christ, because we are blood-bought believers. Yet they think they can do this and not stand together in gospel unity with one another. They can't stand together in gospel-centered unity might be a better way of saying it. That is, people think that everybody can do what is ever right in their own eyes. And I mean, after all, because they have been washed by the blood of Christ, they can do whatever is right. See, there's no need to do life together, people will say. And when they do, it isn't centered around the gospel. It isn't centered around gospel-centered ministry. There's no need to do a ministry together. And when they do, it isn't centered around gospel-centered unity. It's centered around other things. And if somebody ruffles their feathers, they'll just go to another church, the church down the road, because, I mean, they'll welcome them with open arms. That is until somebody starts cramping their style. And then they'll just say, well, I'm, not, I'm just not going to gather together if that happens, and they start cramping my style. After all, what's the point? All of life is worship, right? And we can worship Jesus at home. Besides, we are saved by the blood of Christ, not the works of man. Bottom line is, how can, how can you grow in your affection for the church if you're not living in gospel-centered fellowship? If you're not producing any gospel-centered ministry? If you're not striving for gospel-centered unity. But many of you might think, how can I grow in my affection for the church when everyone does what is right in their own eyes? I really wish I could say that this kind of mindset wasn't true in our generation. I really wish I could proclaim to you that the younger generation, really my generation and younger That this wasn't the the mindset. I I wish I could even say that this wasn't true in our congregation. And in the congregations across this county. But I can't. And it burdens me with a heavy heart. Paul is going to address this issue in our text today which is in Philippians chapter 4, verses 1 through 3. Paul's going to answer this question to us, that how can I grow in my affection for the church when everyone does what's right in their own eyes? And he's going to answer this with a word of exhortation and a word of encouragement. He's going to do this by explaining what it means to stand firm in the Lord. So if you look with me at Philippians chapter 4, Verses 1 through 3, we will see just this truth. Hear now the word of the living and true God. Therefore, my brothers, whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm thus in the Lord, my beloved. I entreat Eodia and I entreat Syntyche to agree in the Lord. Yes, I ask you also, true companions, help these women who have labored side by side with me in the gospel, together with Clement and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. As far as the reading of the word of God, amen. So, right off the bat, Paul uses this huge word, therefore. I'm sure you guys have all heard this saying. Anytime you see the word therefore, you've got to ask, what is it therefore? Right? It's drawing a conclusion from what Paul's previous argument was. But here, the thing is, in this context, Paul is really moving from his main arguments to starting to draw the conclusion to the end of the letter. And as a result of that, Paul reaches back when he says therefore... And he grabs all of the themes that he talked about throughout the rest of the the, the book 
to the Philippians, the letter to the Philippians. He starts to, he wants to bring a remembrance of what it means to have gospel-centered unity, gospel-centered fellowship, what it means, and more specifically in context, of what it means to live as citizens of heaven, where we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly bodies to be like his glorious body, to the power that enabled him to subject all things to himself. Paul says, therefore, as a result of everything that I just said, as a result of all of the theological discussions that we have talked about, the Christ coming, taking upon flesh, the eternal God humbled himself by becoming, taking on the form of a man, being born in the likeness of sin, and taking upon flesh. All of that, therefore, says my brothers, whom I love and long for, my joy in my crown. Stand firm thus in the Lord. Well, how do you stand firm in the Lord? Well, first off, you can see in verse 1, you stand firm in the Lord by seeing your family tree. Paul has used this terminology, brothers, or brothers and sisters, quite frequently throughout this letter. But in this exact point right here, it has real significance. Because it's not just a matter of saying, hey bro. Or it's not just a matter of saying brothers and sisters. It's actually talking about your eternal familyhood. Your eternal tree. God has adopted you as children. I mean, there's the... the Within this text right here, you can see the doctrine of adoption. That those whom he predestined, those whom he called, he predestined. Those whom he predestined, he will glorify. You who have believed in Jesus Christ have been given the right to be called children of God. You are adopted into the family of God. Oh, so to stand firm in the Lord, you must see the, what your family tree is. And it must uh, put up a desire in your heart. Not only for yourself, but all of God's elect. See, in today's day and age, we look as we spoke about in Sunday school. We look inwardly at just ourselves. And I'm adopted. I'm a part of the children of God. But what about those who are of God's elect that you don't know yet? They're of the family tree too. We should be looking to them, our brothers and sisters, who may not yet know the Lord. See, today we want to say, oh, the doctrine of election. Oh, what are you going to unpack now? That's deep theological understanding. Maybe we don't need to hear that. We just need a word of encouragement. Brothers and sisters, there's no greater encouragement to know that before the foundation of the world, God chose you to be in his family. So when Paul says, therefore, my brothers, he's given you a word of encouragement. He, just like he was given the Philippians, regardless of what's going on in your life, you are a child of God. Regardless of what's going on. See, doctrine is not something that's a bad thing which many people think today, but your doctrine should be practical in your life. It's what should give you encouragement. If you have the solid foundation as, of Scripture as your doctrine, but you're not practically living it out and letting it dictate what you're doing, it's just, it's, it's nothing important to you. But brothers and sisters, be encouraged that if you are in the family tree, God has chose you before the foundation of the world. And not just for my, I'm not just saying this, I get this right from Scripture. If you flip back to the left with me, look at that, I flipped right to it. Um, but back to Ephesians chapter 1, verses 4 and 5, Paul makes this very clear. He says in verse 4, even as he, that is God the Father, chose us in him before the foundation of the world that we, we should be holy and blameless before him. In love he predestined us for adoptions as sons through Jesus Christ according to the purpose of his will. To the praise of his glorious grace with which he has blessed us in the beloved. See that word beloved there 
It's really the same thing as saying my brothers. See, God has chose you. See, you stand firm in the Lord by seeking the family tree, recognizing that you are in the family of God. But you also see this in verse 3, where he says at the end of verse 3 in Philippians chapter 1, verse 3, he says, whose names are in the book of life. Yeah, there's books in heaven. It's not just the Bible. The, the Bible talks about how there are other books. The book of life. And it says that specifically in Revelation, this isn't just a book of life. It's a book of the, the, the Lamb. It says in Revelation, if you flip the whole way to the end, to Revelation 13, 8, speaking about on the last days when the, 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 the beast will come and people will worship the beast, it says in verse 8, Revelation 13, verse 8, he says, all who dwell on earth will worship it. Everyone whose name has not been written before the foundation of the world in the book of life of the Lamb who was slain. See, this is what the book of life is. It's those whose names are in the book. Those are who won't worship the beast. Those who are, you're in the book of life if you are truly adopted into the family of God. You won't worship the beast. You won't worship the systems of this world. You will look to the glory of God. You will look to his church as well. That you will recognize that we are all in the family, of tree, the family tree of God. Brothers and sisters, let this encourage you. That to stand firm in the Lord is to seeing your family tree. And to rejoicing of those who are in the family of God. Maybe those who aren't, that aren't here amongst you yet. Maybe those who don't even know that their name is wrote in the book of the life of the Lamb who was slain before the foundation of the world. Oh, brothers and sisters, that is such an encouragement. As I think through the years myself of not walking with the Lord and walking as an enemy of the cross of Christ, that my name was wrote in the Lamb's book of the life that was wrote before the foundation of the world. That I was predestined to be a child of God. Now there are many people that have given up on me. As I know that many of you may have family members that you would think there's no hope for. Oh, oh brothers and sisters, there's hope. Shine the light of Christ out into every people, everybody. God knows who his are. He has chosen you as his adopted family. Therefore, brothers and sisters, strive to build relationships in the church that have eternal consequences. That will get them to glory. Live your life in such a way that these relationships that you live in, that you have, that you're striving to show them what it means to be a child of God. See, Paul's love for God's elect and his desire for them to walk in the fruits of the Spirit is clearly proclaimed throughout this whole letter. And specifically right here. You can see the fruits of the Spirit Paul was focusing on, which is love, joy, and peace most particularly, is what you're seeing here. You see that Paul is saying that you can stand firm in the Lord by striving to have this divine affection that it was a result from the love that you have, the joy that you have, and the peace that you have. Look at verse 1 with me again. He says, Therefore, my brothers, whom I love and long for, my joy and my crown. See, notice right off the bat, Paul isn't valuing stuff. He's not valuing, he doesn't find candy is the most valuable thing. Although candy is a wonderful thing, right? He doesn't value nice cars and concrete floors. He doesn't even say, I value life. He says, I value people. My brothers whom I love and long for. My joy and my crown. See, Paul has a divine affection for God's elect. In such a way that he lives his life for their sake. What did he say just a few verses back? For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. 
That's what our lives should be lived for. To die is gain. Because it is. Absent from the body, present with the Lord. Do you have a divine affection for God's people in such a way that you don't want to be away from them? See, Paul values people, not stuff. But we have to ask, is is Paul really focusing on the present reality? Or is he focusing on the future reality? I would lay before you that it's both. You see, in the present reality, this really reflects what he said just a few verses back to the left in chapter 2, when Paul says in verse 2, Complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and with one mind. See, Paul wants them to be his joy and his crown in this present reality. Do you look at the people that's around you, the people of the church, not the building, the people of the church in such a way that they are your joy, that they are your crown, regardless of what's going on, that you long for them. See, Paul says in this present reality, whom I love and long for, I mean, this is really, Paul said this again, to grab other themes and bring them in. He says in in, in, in chapter 1, flat out, that he longed for you. He loves his people. But there is a future to this. This, So Paul isn't speaking just about this future, or this present love, in this present um, longing for them, but he's also talking about, I have a, a, a longing for the future for them, that you are my joy and my crown in the future. Look at, flip to just the, the left, the verse, chapter 2, verse 16. Paul says, hold fast to the word of life, so that in the day of Christ I may be proud that I did not run in vain, or labor in vain. See, The people that Paul is ministering to, the people that are in his life, the people that are God's elect, the adopted children of God, they are his reason for boasting. And they are his reason in future glory that they they will be his crown. They are his treasure. A parallel to this is in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 19 and 20. Paul says, For what is our hope or joy or crown of boasting before our God, before our Lord Jesus and his coming? Is it not you? For you are our glory and joy. See, brothers and sisters, we should not be looking at stuff. We should have a divine affection. Not only an affection for right here and right now, but we should be living our lives in such a way that the the seeds that we're planting, the, the, the life that we're doing with one another, it's encouraging us and it's storing up treasure for us in heaven. See, God calls all of his people together with, with divine affection for one another to stand firm in the Lord And to have a love and a longing for one another that no matter what is going on, they're there. God has gifted each and every one of us in such a way for building up the body of Christ. And to stand firm in the Lord is to have a divine affection for one another. That's what Paul says in verse 1 again. He says, to stand firm thus in the Lord, my beloved. See, I, I, I know I've said this to you guys a million times. I am a, a nerd. These little words like thus, that's so important. Why? The, the literal translation of this would say, therefore, my brothers, whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, in this way, that's what the word thus means, in this way, stand firm in the Lord, my beloved. You notice the word, my beloved, in love and long for? It's mentioned twice in one verse. Paul's trying to point to us saying, love, 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 love. What's it look like to love? 
What does it look like to stand firm in the Lord? That you do it in this way. You stand firm in the Lord when you actually have a love and a longing for God's people. If you don't have a love and a longing for God's people, what makes you think that you are actually in the family of God? What makes you think you're of God's adopted children? See, because God will give you a divine affection. You know, this can be practically seen in even just in... Every, most of you in here are dog lovers. And you know the old saying that the word dog is actually God spelled backward, right? And our dogs show affection. Even if you won't give them a treat or if you have this habit of breaking their treat in half. We have... A dog really illustrates a true love for us. It doesn't matter how you treat your dog. They're always coming at you with a smile on their face and loving you and wanting to lick your face or give you a hug or give you a comfort. They have an affection towards you regardless of what's going on. That is really a nice illustration for us to see God's love for us. And this, at, at, at a, a, a higher level, is the divine affection that we should have for one another. It's an affection that the Lord puts into our hearts for one another, that you have a longing and a loving for. I mean, in Paul, again, to flip back to chapter 1, I mean, like I said, he's grabbed all of these themes from out the whole text and drove it right here at this word, therefore. But in chapter 1, he says, I thank God in all my remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine, for you all making my prayer with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. See, Paul has a loving affection for his people. And this is probably because of the very fact that he prays for them on a constant basis. He has a, a loving affection because he's standing firm in the Lord. And for you to stand firm in the Lord would mean that you do it in this way. That you love God's people in such a way that you're going to spiritual war for them. That you're praying for them on a constant basis. That you're loving and longing for them. Pray not only for yourself, but pray for your church. If you don't have this affection, if you legitimately say, yeah, I do care about the church, but you don't have a longing in your heart for them, you don't have a longing in your heart to see God's people built up. But you know you love Jesus. Pray, beg the Lord. Lord, give me this divine affection. Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief, Jesus. Was proclaimed by a man whose son was possessed. And he said, Lord, if you would, heal him. He will heal your heart if you seek him. Lord, help us to have this divine affection for you. This should be our prayer for everyone. But it's more than just a, having an affection for God's people to stand firm in the Lord. You have to have a divinely sanctioned unity. See, to stand firm in the Lord, you must do so by striving for gospel-centered unity. Look in verse 2. Paul says, I entreat Eodia and I entreat Syntyche to agree in the Lord. See, Paul is really, at this point, giving us an exhortation. He's moved from an encouragement to saying to my beloved, you are the adopted children of God and you are to have this divine affection if you really are standing firm in the Lord. But now he's moving to exhort us. Give you a little bit of a warning. He says to agree in the Lord. This isn't, he's, he's not meaning, well, just uh, agree to disagree. Paul has said throughout this epistle, Numerous times, 
four, five, six different times about having your mind set on the Lord. So when he says agree here, this is actually the same word that says set your mind on. Set your mind on the Lord. Again in 2.2, 2, he said just that, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Isn't, you see how that's exactly the same thing that he, he's saying here. He's not taking favoritism from Iodia or Syntyche. He's exhorting each of them. Have your mind set. Have your mind set. Iodia, have your mind set. Syntyche, have your mind set. But notice it's not just the mindset on agreeing on anything. It's to agree in the Lord. See, church unity was too important to leave it to a private matter. Now these are two sisters that have walked with the Lord faithfully. They have struggled side by side, as Paul says, with him in the gospel, with Clement and the rest of his fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. These were women who strove to preach the gospel, that had a gospel-centered ministry. Why? Because for a long time, they had a gospel-centered unity. And somehow or another, they, they've had some disagreements. Maybe it's their methodology. Maybe it's false teaching to come in. But nevertheless, we don't know. We don't know what it was, but we know it has to be something centered around a gospel-centered unity to the point where Paul brings this out. He points this out. It, it was too important of a matter to leave it privately. Now we know that these two women have not got to the point of forsaking the gospel, that they became enemies of the cross of Christ, I mean, their names are still here. And Paul reaches out and says, you too, true companion, help these women to have the gospel-centered unity. Now there's much speculation that has been come about by this word in verse 3 that says, true companion. And who is this? We could go on and on about who this may be. I personally believe this is probably Luke. If you follow the book of Acts... When it moves from the they to the we is when Luke comes into the, into the picture in Acts 16. But you don't see Luke again until about three or four years later when they went to Philippi. So I, I actually believe that this is Luke, but that's irrelevant. It can't be proven, and it's speculation. The, the point in saying is that, that Paul is calling and the whole church to stand firm in the Lord by striving for gospel-centered unity. We should be doing this. We should be striving for gospel-centered unity, standing side by side, having our mindset not just on anything, but in the Lord. Notice he uses that twice. He uses it in verse 1. He says, stand firm in this way in the Lord. And then he says, stand firm in verse 2 and with your mindset in the Lord. Now this isn't just thinking and meditating, oh Lord, we love you. We... No, this is doing something. This is moving from the pews to the public. This is having your mindset on the Lord. Doing something, doing ministry, having gospel-centered ministry so that you can have gospel-centered unity. If you don't have gospel-centered unity, you're truly not standing firm in the Lord. What does it mean to have unity? You know, have you guys ever seen mountain climbers? I've actually always wanted to mountain climb. If you ever watch two people mountain climb, then they, they actually tie themselves off to one another. They have one rope and they tie themselves off to the rope into each other. That way if somebody's foot slips, the other's there to grab them. And they bring them to safety. That is what we as the church are supposed to do. We are to, we are to agree in the Lord, having our mind set in the Lord, standing side by side for the faith of the gospel. This is really Paul continuing out to say what he said in in chapter 1, verses 
27 when he says, Only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or I'm absent, I may hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit, with one mind, striving side by side to make yourselves feel good that you've come to church on Sunday. No. That we've come together one day a week and we're good. No. That we strive side by side for the faith of the gospel. This is the faith of the gospel of all of God's people. Having a divine affection for even those who may not know Jesus yet. See, to be united, you must know what you are to be united around. I mean, there's some real practical application to this. Do you, how do you know what it means and what it looks like to stand united in gospel-centered ministry? To stand firm, striving for gospel-centered unity. If you're not even, if you don't even know what it says in the Bible to do. I mean, everybody's heard the application of to read your Bible more, read your Bible more, read your Bible more. But it looks like we've heard that so much that we say, I don't want to read my Bible anymore. Or I don't want to come to Bible studies. I don't want to come to prayer meetings. I've got more important things in my life to do. But I love you and I want to gather together with you. And I think I can be a part of the body of Christ, although I'm not actually doing any. Gospel, having gospel-centered unity, as I spoke of in our introduction. Brothers and sisters, we must strive to study our Bibles, to know what it is that God has for us. That's how he speaks to us. Do you come to the prayer meetings? Do you pray at home? Do you have a divine affection for your church? See, all Christians want unity. If you truly are a Christian, you do want unity. But how can we obtain this unity when everyone does what's right in their own eyes? Well, if you stand firm in the Lord by setting your mind on the gifts of help, you very well can stand firm in the Lord. What do I mean by the gifts of help? Well, look in verse 3. Paul says, Yes, I ask you also, true companions, help these women who have labored side by side with me in the gospel, together with Clement and the rest of my fellow workers, whose names are in the book of life. See that word, little word, help? That's a pretty powerful word. I mean... There's a true spiritual gift. It's called the gifts of help. And I would say that that's probably a gift that is least thought about in today's day and age. You know, if you look at, through all the different passages in the scripture that talk about spiritual gifts. Some have a, a gift of preaching and teaching and healing and speaking in tongues and gifts of exhortation and so forth and so forth. I would say the least focused on gift is the gift of help. And Paul says in 1 Corinthians 12... Verse 28, and God has appointed in the church first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles, and gifts of healing. We all want to be able to heal our brothers and sisters, right? We all have long, a love and a longing to see those who are sick being healed, and rightfully so. But after the gifts of healing, the most neglected, I would say, is the gift of helping. And then there's a gifts of administrating in various other kinds of gifts and tongues. But this gifts of helping, this is where we as a church need to focus. A gift of helping might be helping a brother and sister strive to be here. That might be your children. That might be your, your grandparents, your aunts, your uncles, friends. Gifts of help might be somebody needs their dog watched. Somebody needs a new roof put on their house. I mean, that gift is very broad. But we as the church should be 
Standing firm in the Lord by setting our minds on using a gift of help. We can't do that if we're not, if we don't have a divine affection for God's adopted children. We can't do that if we don't have gospel-centered unity. An act of generosity goes a long way. But how much more important is it to help somebody to stand firm in the Lord? You know, we can have dinners and all kinds of outreaches, which I love them. I, I think a church that isn't doing outreach, that's drawing people in the Lord, how can you possibly say, I am following Christ, or staying within context, Paul said, according to therefore, be imitators of me as I am of Christ. A church that is not doing outreach, a church that only gathers together one day a week, or maybe one day a month, or... Maybe, maybe you're here twice a month, but a church that is not doing outreach cannot say, be imitators of me as I am of Christ. If your goal is to say, I'll see you again next Sunday, you're not following Christ. And you need to repent. That's sin. How can you follow Christ when you're not doing the things that Christ is doing? And you're especially not using your spiritual gift of helps. Helping somebody to stand firm in the Lord is a great calling. Brothers and sisters, we must strive to help others recognize their gifts and help them to succeed at using them. This is not just the work of a pastor. This is the work of each and every one of us. To remember, look at verse 1. It says, it doesn't say, stand firm thus in the Lord. I mean, the text does say that, and that's the proper interpretation. But it is better to see this in the way it is literally to, in this way, stand firm in the Lord. Because that word thus, almost, even though it's not an archaic word, we almost see it as if it's archaic. But he's literally giving you a command. In this way, stand firm in the Lord. How? To have a love and a longing for God's people. To have a love and a longing for the unity of the body of Christ. To have a love and a longing for gospel-centered unity and gospel-centered ministry. That's how you stand firm in the Lord. It doesn't matter how old you are, how young you are. Be a city that is on a hill shining the light of Christ into the world. See, we ought to strive to help others. Brothers and sisters, as you gather together, God has given you gifts. You may not even recognize them. You may not even know them. But the very fact that God has divinely transferred you from the domain of darkness into the kingdom of his beloved son, that he has given you the faith to believe that Jesus Christ, who is the eternal God, took upon flesh in your stead, lived the life you couldn't live, died the death that you deserved so that you didn't go into hell. He gave you the faith to believe in him and he rose from the dead that you may be justified. The very fact that he has given you that faith to believe, he also gives you the gift for building up the body of Christ. You may not recognize what that gift is, but it is there. And by you being in the presence of other believers, even if they don't even recognize it, they will someday come to faith because their names are in the book of the life of the Lamb who was slain before the foundation of the world. That gift that God has given you will shine through and pierce a heart pierce into their dark heart. And as a result of the gift that God has given you, he will use you to bring them to saving faith. You may not know what that gift is. The others around you may not know. But we have to strive to use those gifts. See, the gifts of help is one of the Least rated gifts. Everybody wants to be a mouth. As it says in Corinthians, talking about building up of the body of Christ. Everybody wants to be a mouth or maybe a hand or an eye. But if the eye says to the hand, I don't need you, 
the body will fall apart. Can everybody be a hand? No. Can everybody be an eye? No. Can everybody be a mouth? No. Can everybody be a foot? No. And if they all were, how would the body be built up? Brothers and sisters, what are you? Are you an eye? Are you a hand? Are you a foot? Are you the mouth? See, we're not to neglect to use those spiritual gifts. But when we don't gather together to use our gifts, you're actually saying to the church, even though I may not recognize it, but I'm a mouth, the church don't need me. Or maybe I'm an eye, the church don't need me. By you not gathering together to use your gifts of help, to do gospel-centered unity, to stand firm in the Lord, you're actually hurting the body. See, we must strive to help others recognize their gifts. And the gift that God has given you, it will pour out of you. Seek to have this divine affection for the church. See, gospel-centered fellowship or gospel-centered unity will produce gospel-centered soldiers. To stand firm in the Lord by striving to be a gospel-centered soldier. Look at the second part of verse 3. Paul says, Help these women who have labored side by side with me in the gospel, together with Clement and the rest of of my fellow workers, whose names are in the book of life. See, when Paul said to labor side by side, this means to struggle along with, to strive in gospel-centered ministry. That's what they're doing here. Paul is saying that they, they are striving to present the gospel. They are striving to do ministry. They are striving to be gospel-centered soldiers. Your mission of the church is to strive to be a soldier in the spiritual war that we are in. Do you put on the full armor of God? Are you striving as a gospel soldier, struggling with others in gospel-centered ministry? I could go on and on about a little point here that I think is very important to Notice, in today's day and age, there's an attack on masculinity. There's an attack on femininity. People will say, oh, you, you think the Bible only allows pastors as men. Well, yeah, that is all it allows. That church leaders have to be men. Yeah, and I'm not going to try to unpack that. Why at this moment that's beyond what this text means. But what I'm going to point out is that there is an attack in a twisting of what the scriptures say. They, people will use as an argument when the scriptures are very clear that it's only men who God has called to shepherd his flock. And they'll say, well, why can't women do it? Well, women are just supposed to be stay at home and be barefoot and naked and have popping out babies and that's it. That's the highest calling in all of history, of all of mankind, to be a mom. But that doesn't mean that moms aren't engaged in gospel-centered ministry. I mean, you're raising up children. But even above and beyond that, I mean, mothers, if you have a daughter at home and a, or a son at home, how are you fighting this spiritual warfare in their lives? You are to be doing, uh, being a gospel-centered soldier. If you are a blood-bought believer and you truly have an affection, a divine affection for those whose names are in the book of the Lamb that was slain before the foundation of the world, the book of life, if you truly have that, it starts with your own daughter. It starts with your own son. But above and beyond that, if I may say that, notice these women were laboring side by side with Paul in this gospel-centered warfare. These, these women weren't just staying at home barefoot and naked, popping out babies. They were hitting streets. 
They were presenting the gospel. They were striving side by side in this spiritual war that we're in. They were becoming gospel-centered soldiers. And this is what it means to stand firm in the Lord. That you are striving to present the gospel. They were striving to evangelize. Are you evangelizing? Are you sharing the gospel? Do you understand the gospel? What is the gospel? If you're not, why not? If you are not sharing your faith, and not just what the Lord has done in you, but actually presenting the gospel, not God has a perfect plan for you and loves you, but actually unpacking the gospel, can you do that? Have you put much thought into that? Because if you haven't, that might be why you're not sharing your faith. And that's not saying that you're necessarily not a blood-bought believer. It's just sometimes these are things that we need to, to think about. And to be able to share. Again, how can you say you're following Christ if you're not imitating him? See, Jesus gave us one command. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And he said, Behold, I will be with you to the end of the age. See, making disciples starts right in your own home. You're leading by example right in your own home. You're also leading by example in how you interact with the community. How you interact with the church. See, your mission as a church is to stand firm in the Lord through gospel-centered fellowship while doing gospel-centered ministry. See, we stand firm in the Lord when, we, when we're striving for gospel-centered fellowship that stirs up a divine affection for the church. See, if you're not doing any of the stuff that we talked about today, and you're just coming to church once a week, or maybe once every other week, or once a month, what makes you think that you're actually standing firm in the Lord? Now, you can also, as a side note, say, if I'm not doing that, I should be testing my own heart. Scripture tells us to evaluate yourself, examine yourself, to make sure you believe the faith that you did not believe in vain. If you're not standing firm in the Lord, you may not be a Christian. Or maybe you have been, and you are, but... You just haven't been guided and shepherded and loved in such a way that it gives you the encouragement. Brothers and sisters, as I am constantly calling you to evaluate your faith, examining your heart, I'm not doing it to doubt, to give you a doubt in your salvation. I'm doing it because I have a divine affection for you. And I have a love and a long for you that you will finish the race, that you would be my crown and joy, that I could lay down my life as a living sacrifice for you, being poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrificial offering of your faith, and that I could be glad and rejoice in you. I want to help you grow in your divine affection, that you may help me grow in the Lord. See, that's what happens when we strive side by side, standing firm in the Lord, that you're helping one another. And that's what it means to have gospel-centered unity. Standing firm in the Lord takes more than just gathering. You have to have an honest commitment to not only the Lord, but His church. See, that's what it means to be a member of a church. To be committed to the church. Whether it brings you life or death, that you put the church first. Above and beyond everything. Why? Because you're committed to the body of Christ. You know you're a part of the body of Christ. He died for you. You're part of the body of Christ. 
You might be his hands, his feet, his eyes. And when you're not standing firm in gospel-centered ministry, when you're not committed to his church, that means you're not committed to his body, which means you're not committed to him. And this is why we should be looking inwardly. Because to stand firm in the Lord is to have a divine affection, not only for him, but for his church. See, stand firm in the Lord and you will, not you might, you will have a divine affection for the church. You are called to safeguard against division in the church. You are called to strive to seed all the family of God. To having a divine affection for God and his people. To strive in gospel-centered unity. To use the gifts that he's given you. And particularly, according to this text, using the gifts of help. We all can bring help. You're called to all be gospel-centered soldiers. So that we can have this divine affection. See, we're all called to safeguard against disunity. To safeguard against division. We're called to be one. One in love, one in affection, one in gospel-centered ministry. One that we can cry on each other's shoulders, that we can support each other when support needs brought. To do life together. Stand firm in the Lord, brothers and sisters, and you will have a divine affection, not only for Christ, but for his church. You are called to safeguard through gospel-centered ministry, through gospel-centered unity. Brothers and sisters, stand firm in the Lord and strive to have a divine affection for the church.